This is one of six short films which look beyond hierarchy at two different approaches to self-organisation. This part is about working with power. It's invisible, full of emotional charge and hard to talk about, but what is it? One definition is the ability to influence people or things, to make change happen or keep things the same. For example, power can be used in different ways. It can be used constructively within an organisation to further its aims or destructively to further personal aims at the expense of the organisation. It might look something like the force from Star Wars that is invisible and all around us. It has different shapes in different organisations. And there is personal power, the influence we have individually, which is different from the shape of power in a group. There's also power outside of an organisation, how external things influence. So the picture is complex. And this episode focuses on power between people and within organisations. And one of the key issues is how decisions get made and who decides what. This part looks at how this is done with a conventional hierarchy, as a reference point for what the other two approaches are shifting away from. Here, power is concentrated in people who are in positions at the top, who make decisions, control resources, can tell other people what to do, and have responsibility. While other types of hierarchies can be very collaborative, where there is lots of participation, democracy, and delegated decision-making, but it's still up to the people at the top whether this happens or not, and normally it can be withdrawn. Some benefits here are that in a healthy hierarchy, it's clear who has authority about which decisions, so they can be made by the people with that authority can be easy to know what is expected of you. Good leaders can create visions which inspire others to get on board. Good managers can delegate authority and empower others. Decisions can be made fast. Some challenges are that so much depends on the abilities and motivations of the few at the top of the pyramid. And heroic leaders need to see and understand enough to make good decisions, which is hard in a complex and changing world and be very good at listening, gathering, and making sense of diverse ideas. Hierarchies can easily create conditions of competition, power struggles, and battles for ego domination, often at the expense of the organisation. And wider, cultural shifts away from the power over relationships and towards power with collaboration means that the things that make hierarchies work well are becoming less popular, and many people are demanding more of a say. Tools which can help power to be effectively used in a hierarchy are clear job descriptions, line management and reporting systems provide clarity about where accountability and decision-making authority lie. Clear decision-making processes in meetings so it's clear when a decision is being made, whether it's being made by a person in authority or a vote or seeking consensus. Clear plans and strategies so that people know what is expected of them and if they are being successful or not. Clear procedures for what to do if people feel that power is being abused, such as robust grievance and disciplinary procedures. Transparent systems for succession and promotion for people to work their way up the hierarchy based on clear criteria of merit. But what does all this look like when people organise without a hierarchical structure? The next two parts look at two approaches to self-organising which are shaped by different ways of seeing and being in the world. In organisations with a more collaborative mindset, approach and set of values, when the world is experienced not as a collection of separate entities but as a constant flux and flow, here power emerges synergistically from our connection with others in our environment and there is a shift in what we care about from me to we. The perception of power changes from power over to power with, so power is shared. For example, decisions are not made by individuals but by the group as a whole. This happens in different ways, by voting or some form of agreement or consensus. 
Consensus is often misunderstood to mean that everyone agrees, but that's not the case when it's done well, such as with formal consensus. Here, it means that no one disagrees enough to block something, but that they can live with it. Some benefits here are that normally, the more say someone has, the more they support the decision. So where a leader consults others, they're more likely to get buy-in from others than if they made a decision on their own. And shared discussion with a vote often gets more support than a decision just made by the leader, even if it's after the discussion. And a high-quality consent-based process normally generates more support than any of the others. Challenges of working with power in this way are more commitment often requires more discussion, which takes more time. Groups who seek agreement about everything, like what kind of paper to buy for the office, can find it hard to get anything done. Groups which try to flatten power differences with a horizontal structure often end up with the shadow power structure of an informal hierarchy, which is taboo to talk about. Again, it's common to see egos trying to dominate, but less so if safety and trust are created to talk about and clarify power issues. Some tools here are mindfulness and awareness techniques that help us become more aware of our own relationship to power, our triggers and how these show up in our groups. Ground rules to create safety and trust so that sensitive power issues can be made transparent and talked about openly. External facilitation. To facilitate these sensitive conversations if there aren't already the skills to do this in the organisation. Creating clarity before decisions are made about the methods that will be used to make those decisions. For example, in sociocracy, a consent-based policy decision is taken about the methods to be used for operational decisions. A tool called blended decision-making, which matches the amount of buy-in needed for a decision with the amount of input required from people. Making decisions by formal consensus. A decision-making tool called gradients of agreement, which makes visible where there is agreement disagreement, and some of the shades of grey in between. Another approach to self-organisation beyond hierarchy is more agile, responsive, adaptable and evolutionary. And there are many examples of this. This part looks at holacracy as an example of self-organisation with a dynamic steering approach. Here, power isn't concentrated in any people, or shared as in a flat group, Instead, it's invested in a process, articulated in the holoxy constitution, which is like the rules of the game, and then authority is distributed in roles which have autonomy for how they meet their own accountabilities. Some benefits here are that it doesn't depend on a heroic leader to lead well, or a heroic facilitator to include everyone. It takes some of the plus points from hierarchy, clear accountabilities for making decisions, and some plus points from collaboration, creating support for decisions, plugging into group wisdom, creating synergy and enthusiasm, and combines them together in a new system where roles have autonomy in how they do the work, in operations. They can get on with it and don't need to check everything with everybody. And in governance meetings, different views are integrated in the decisions about which roles have authority for doing the work. Some of the challenges of this approach are that it can be challenging for people who don't like rules and feel they are oppressive or unnecessary. These rules of the game allow no room for egos to dominate, so avoiding the power struggles which are so common in the other two ways of running organisations. But this makes it very challenging for our own individual egos. Some examples of tools here are the Holoxy Constitution, as a set of rules which apply the same to everyone. The distributed authority system, which gives each role holder autonomy about how they energise their roles. This provides a high degree of clarity about where decision-making authority lies. The distinction between operations, which is about doing the work, and governance, which is about how we work together, with different meeting processes for each. The Holoxy governance meeting process for clarifying how authority is distributed amongst roles ongoingly 
and which can be adapted as needed. And the integrative decision-making process used in governance, with clear rules in the constitution about how decisions get made there. To summarise, sorting out power issues is one of the most difficult things to do and most important things to work well, but it's not impossible. Each of the three shapes explored here, hierarchical pyramid, collaborative circle or self-organising fractal can work effectively if they are clear and a good fit with the organisational culture and conditions in the external environment. Knowing this, you can make conscious choices to clarify power relationships in your organisation so they fit well with your culture and environment and can adapt if needed. So you can work together in ways which are brilliant and inspiring. These are just three models which don't exactly fit reality and not one of them is better than the others. Rather, each model fits better into a different set of conditions, culture and values. Many organisations are a complex mix of these patterns and recognising them will enable you to make conscious choices about which works best in your situation. Which is the better fit for your organisation, environment and where things are moving to?